Hello, my name's Emily Nicholson, and I'm a professor in conservation science at Deakin University in Melbourne, Australia. Until recently, we had no consistent way to assess risks to whole ecosystems. We needed an approach that could tell us which ecosystems are at risk of collapse in the near future and why. We also wanted it to tell us which areas need protection and which should be restored to support the great diversity of species and ecological processes. We needed a method based in science and provides definitive categories of risk. In 2014, this new approach, the Red List of Ecosystems, was adopted as the global standard by IUCN, or International Union for Conservation of Nature. The Red List of Ecosystems protocol involves at its core a diagnostic process, much like uh, when a doctor sees a patient. That process involves engaging a number of experts and scientific research to try and understand the key processes that are really important in sustaining the functionality of the ecosystem, as well as sustaining all of the species that are part of those systems. And so doing a Red List of Ecosystems assessment is a very strategic way of going about developing a management plan for the sustainability of that system. There's a, a range of different scientific theories that were brought together to synthesise this approach that we have in um, assessing risks to ecosystems. It's really focused on the notion that there's a lot of different things that can go wrong with ecosystems, but there are common symptoms that we may be able to detect that will help us understand the level of risk that any individual ecosystem faces. So two of those four symptoms relate to the spatial characteristics of ecosystems, and two of them relate to functional aspects of, of ecosystem behaviour, because there's a lot that can go wrong with an ecosystem without necessarily any change in its distribution. So those four elements kind of work together as an ensemble. You know, they're complementary in detecting different symptoms and different processes and different threats that apply to ecosystems. And we have a fifth criterion in the suite that is designed to bring all of those things together into a, a single assessment. And usually that requires quite a lot of understanding and data to apply, but we do have that kind of data for some ecosystems. One of the key challenges in um, assessing risks to ecosystems is finding the right data and enough data. Information knowledge is always limiting, but um, the Red List of Ecosystems is structured in a way that accommodates varying levels of, of knowledge. It often comes down to where you look and how hard you look for this, this knowledge. And uh, often people see initially a deficit of understanding and a lack of data. But uh, if you start thinking creatively and looking in a range of different sources and places, different cultures and work that's been lying around for a very long time and perhaps forgotten, uh, much of that information turns out to be very useful in a Red List assessment. More than 3,000 ecosystems have been assessed worldwide using the Red List of Ecosystems criteria across marine, freshwater and terrestrial realms in over 100 countries and on all continents. There's been uptake by governments, non-government organisations, industry and the community. And this has led to impacts such as government regulation and protection of ecosystems, investment in restoration and industry decision making, for example in Colombia. The Red List of Ecosystems criteria have been adopted into environmental legislation in many countries one such example is South Africa. South Africa is a well-denated terrestrial ecosystem map that describes the 458 national vegetation types nested across the nine biomes. Our results show that 120 terrestrial ecosystem types are threatened, from which 51 are critically endangered and 55 are endangered, while 14 are in a vulnerable state. The world famous Fenbos biome has the highest number of threatened ecosystems, followed by the grassland and savannas. South Africa is rather unique in that our ecosystem red listing for the terrestrial environment is already closely linked to government policy. As a result, in addition to the technical processes, we have a number of social and political and legal processes that we have to go through when undertaking the red list of ecosystems. These stakeholder engagements culminate in the legal listing of our red list of ecosystems for the terrestrial realm. The results of the assessment 
are widely used in such processes as systematic conservation planning, which in South Africa underpins our legal land use decision-making tools called power regional plans, and also widely used in restoration planning and even protected area expansion planning in South Africa. The strong legal framing of South Africa's Red List is one of its great strengths. It, however, does present some challenges in that it introduces a very time-consuming stakeholder engagement process. But that in itself is a strength because by the end of it, you've got a very good understanding of the Red List and buy into the product. My name is Andres Etter. I led this uh, project that undertook the Red List of Ecosystems for Colombia. Colombia is a highly ecologically diverse country with more than 81 ecosystems which have been mapped through this assessment. We found that 20 ecosystems were classified as critically endangered with over 80% of their area already transformed. These ecosystems are mainly located in the tropical dry forest biome and in the tropical savannas. Tomatoes is a um, web-based decision support tool that was developed by CI Colombia together with private, public, and academia partners. The power of Tremartos is that it, it uses multiple layers of environmental and social data to help the private sector, the government, and the civil society to assess the potential impacts of infrastructure, mining, and gas projects. Since 2017, it included the, a layer of the red list of ecosystems. Additionally, Tremartos uses national policies to recommend offset measures that projects should include in their costs if they generate a natural capital loss. The dryland forests in the Caribbean were at a high risk one regional protected area was created that is called Palomar in the municipality of Piojo, not far from Cartagena. So this small protected area was established and one of the ideas was to promote the conservation at regional um, level of the dryland forest of the Caribbean. The Red List of Ecosystems, the assessment, helped us to identify that there are still big gaps in the protected areas and that it's a very useful tool to start thinking about prioritizing restoration of ecosystems, which have been largely lost. A growing number of assessments are now found in a database on the Red List of Ecosystems website, which also hosts the guidelines for applying the criteria and free online training courses. The database allows anyone to explore Red Listed Ecosystems find out where they are, what makes them unique, and why they are threatened. Each assessed ecosystem belongs to an ecosystem functional group in the IUCN Global Ecosystem Typology. The typology was developed through collaboration and consultation with over 100 specialists and experts around the world, led by Professor David Keith. To apply the Red List criteria consistently around the world in different kinds of systems, from marine systems to terrestrial deserts and, and so on, we need a framework so that we have a common language and a common understanding about what different kinds of ecosystems are. And so we embarked on the development of this typological framework that describes the major kinds of ecosystems that occur around the world so that someone working in Ghana is actually talking about the same thing as someone working in Venezuela, for example, uh, when we talk about tropical moist forests. The IUCN Red List of Ecosystems and Global Ecosystem Typology provides science to support policy and management decisions. This is urgently needed to achieve goals for sustaining nature and its contributions to people. These include the post-2020 Global Biodiversity Framework and the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. In turn, these influence the goals that countries set and their policies, laws and actions to meet the challenge of reversing biodiversity loss worldwide. Mm -hmm.